Greetings. My name's Kathy, and I'm with the Friends of Arlington's David M. Brown Planetarium. And today with us is Dr. Tom Holtz from the University of Maryland, and he is going to talk to us about tyrannosaurs because while we are supporting the planetarium, we think the planetarium is a great place to learn about all sorts of different science, not just astronomy. And uh, it's a community space. And so while we're not in the planetarium right now, we are closed, not only because of the pandemic, but because of construction. While we're closed, we're having some virtual talks. So I'm going to let Dr. Holtz get right into it. And remember that you can ask questions in the chat. Dr. Holtz. All right, great. And we might as well go to the sharing screen and... I will start off my presentation. All right. Okay, so you might think that a, uh, a talk about dinosaurs is a strange thing in a planetarium. After all, you know, some of the stuff we normally show in planetariums are, uh, are the dread enemy of dinosaurs. Uh, but it's all science, it's all interconnected. And what I'll be talking about is some of the research that I've been involved in uh, lately, although I've been working on some of this for uh, the better part of 14 years, um, as well as research from various colleagues that has to do with looking at dinosaurs as they grow up, and in particular focusing on my favorite type of dinosaurs, the tyrannosaurs. So growing up tyrant style, the shifting ecology of tyrannosaurs during growth. And i um, got my Twitter handle down here and uh, my email if you want to uh, check that out. As you can see from the nameplates down here, or the insignia, I'm a paleontologist with the University of Maryland in the Department of Geology, and I'm also a research associate with the Department of Paleobiology at the Smithsonian at the National Museum of Natural History, which in the hopefully not too distant future will be open and available for people to view again. So as I said, I am a, a dinosaur paleontologist. I work um, on not merely dinosaurs, but specifically carnivorous dinosaurs are my main focus. And my primary focus, in fact, are the tyrannosaurs, uh, T-Rex and its kin. And now you might think that a dinosaur paleontologist is redundant, but in fact, the vast majority, the vast, vast majority of paleontologists work on creatures that aren't dinosaurs. You just don't hear as much about their research. So, uh, Tyrannosaurus is one member of a family of dinosaurs called the Tyrannosauridae, and other representatives are shown here. Tarbosaurus from Mongolia, Gorgosaurus, and Albertosaurus from, the, from Canada and the northern U.S., Displetosaurus from the same region, Lythronax from the American Southwest, and there are several others. And as you can see, they're all quite similar in general shape and uh, general shape, they're not that similar in size. They range from small-ish forms, small-ish in this case being something like eight meters long or so, up to giant Tyrannosaurus itself. Um, and the Tyrannosauridae, so it's this part of the family tree here, is just one part of a much larger or more inclusive group of meat-eating dinosaurs called the Tyrannosauroids. And during their evolutionary history, they went from relatively small and weak skulls to the very powerful skulls that characterize the true Tyrannosaurids. Um, they infamously reduced their front limbs to the very tiny limbs that they have. Um, and they increased their running abilities, something we don't always appreciate with tyrannosaurs because most people are used to Tyrannosaurus, which is by far the largest. and which because of its giant size um, suffered from issues that its smaller but close relatives didn't have. And here's another look at the family tree. So here's time, the beginning of the Jurassic down here, the asteroid impact over here at the end of the Cretaceous. And basically among these tyrannosauroids, uh, these early forms, they still had long arms and, and weak skulls. And these later forms typically had small arms. The Tyrannosauridae proper is this star right here. So it's all these critters. Now, the world that the Tyrannosaurids lived in, oh, I should say Tyrannosaurid is the same thing as Tyrannosauridae. It's the English version. Uh, was not quite our world yet in terms of its geography. Pangaea had long since ripped apart. In fact, in many ways, the world of the 
late Cretaceous epoch, within the Cretaceous period in which the Tyrannosaurids lived, uh, was more split up even than today in terms of the effects of plate tectonics and sea level rise. And the Tyrannosaurids were limited to this landmass um, called Asia America. That's the western part of North America uh, to the west of a shallow seaway that split North America in half. Uh, but over what's now the Bering Straits, so the connection between Alaska and Siberia, there was a land connection back in the age of dinosaurs, as there would be later in Earth history as well, that allowed them to travel freely back and forth to Eastern and Central Asia. So collectively, Asia and Laramidia, Laramidia is Western North America, are Asia America. Now, on our side of North America, at least as I say this, and as the planetarium is based in Virginia, uh, there were tyrannosauroids, but not tyrannosaurids. That is a member of the larger group, close cousins of tyrannosaurids like Dryptosaurus and Appalachosaurus on our side of the continent. Um, and in the rest of the world, an entirely different assemblage of dinosaurs. And it's worth noting, as I show these silhouettes up here, that tyrannosaurids, so T-Rex and its uh, American and Asian relatives, shared their community with the horned dinosaurs, the duckbills, the dome heads, the tail clubbed armored dinosaurs, and many of the most popular and famous dinosaurs um, that the general public knows about. Whereas in Europe or the southern continents at the same time, it's an entirely different assemblage of dinosaurs. All right, but what we're going to be focusing on is specifically how did dinosaurs, and in this case, tyrannosaurids, change during growth? But in order to do that, we actually have to identify what are the young individuals. After all, a smaller individual, couldn't it be a small species and not just the juvenile of a large species? So how do we identify young tyrants? Incidentally, throughout, I'll often have specimen numbers uh, placed next to skeletons or individual bones. Specimen numbers are codes that are used um, to catalog individual fossils in the collections at various museums. So in this case, this is the Royal Ontario Museum, that's in Toronto, specimen number 1247, which is a sub-adult individual or juvenile individual of um, Gorgosaurus libratus. Now, when you find a dinosaur, it doesn't come with a label on it telling you its name and telling you its um, age at the time of death. These are hypotheses that we have to test and study. And different researchers will disagree on their conclusions. So for instance, when the first giant dinosaurs, first giant tyrannosaurs were found in Mongolia by expeditions from the Soviet Union, uh, they found individuals of various sizes. And here we see a series of skulls shown to scale with each other. And um, the paleontologists who described these specimens first considered these to represent four different species and three different genera. So a genus is the next larger category. So two species of the dinosaur Gorgosaurus, already known from North America, a new species of the genus Tyrannosaurus, the same genus that Tyrannosaurus rex is in for the largest one, and a medium-sized individual uh, that Meliev named Tarbosaurus ephraimovi. And he and his colleagues considered the smaller individuals from this rock unit called the Nemec formation as distinct species from the bigger ones. And they looked at such things as the jaws were more slender. They had more teeth in the jaws. Uh, the teeth themselves were more blade-like and less, less thick, as is character, uh, characteristic of big adult tyrannosaurids. Uh, the forelimb proportions were different. The hind limb proportions were different, and so forth. So they were distinct. But other researchers, uh, like Maliev's uh, contemporary, Raj Desvensky, looked at the same assemblage of fossils and said, there's a simpler solution than to have these four different species living right next to each other. These are all members of the same species, the growth series or an ontogeny. And uh, by the rules of taxonomy, it wound up that this animal would be called Tarbosaurus batar. Although some people actually do prefer uh, calling it Tyrannosaurus batar, which was actually the original name for the large individual. 
Now, this story has played out many times in the history of paleontology. It is ongoing in uh, the American fossils from the American West today because there are a series of fossils, uh, and a, a skull found in the 1940s, a skeleton found in the early, the first decade of this century, and another specimen found last decade that was recently acquired by the North Carolina State Museum. Um, that are from the same rocks as Tyrannosaurus rex, uh, but seem to be distinct, at least to some people, and are given its own name, Nanotyrannus lancensis. And Nanotyrannus lancensis is considered distinct from Tyrannosaurus rex by some researchers because it has more slender jaws, a uh, higher tooth count, more blade-like teeth, different forelimb proportions, different hind limb proportions. That sounds pretty familiar. And yeah, so for those of us who have been working in Tyrannosaur studies for some time, um, the people who keep on claiming that Nanotyrannus definitely has to be real, uh, it's, it's a story we've seen before. And that's not to say that Nanotyrannus is most definitely distinct from Tyrannosaurus rex. That is a hypothesis that still um, maybe not the better supported of the two, but it is certainly still in play. Uh, but I think the simpler solution is that, as in the case of Tarbosaurus, we're seeing a growth series, and that Nanotyrannus represents the young individuals of the giant Tyrannosaurus rex. Now, babies of archosaurs, archosaurs are the group that today includes crocodilians and birds, but in the past included dinosaurs and actually many other Mesozoic reptiles, um, can often have a very different lifestyle than the adults. So here we see a, a daddy gharial, a giant slender snouted crocodile, or crocodilian I should say, from India, and a host of his babies. And those are his babies. Um, it turns out like their cousins, the birds, crocodilians look after their, their babies early on. Um, but unlike mammals, and unlike even their cousins, the birds, uh, at least most species of birds, crocodilians don't watch after their young for tremendous parts of their life, life cycle. They watch after them for several weeks, um, at which point the young go off and live on their own. And so those tiny little babies have to have a very different lifestyle, a very different ecology than the adults. They can't eat the same prey. Uh, they're on a lot of other creatures' menu uh, that the adult gavial would never have to worry about and so forth. Now, it could be, and some have speculated, that tyrannosaurs and some other dinosaurs lived in groups throughout their entire life cycle. And there's some evidence that suggests maybe in a few species this is true. Uh, in which case, uh, the young might have been provisioned, they might have been provided with food by the adults uh, for quite some time. But this doesn't necessarily, it's not necessarily the case for all tyrannosaurs. And indeed, the evidence that there were living in groups um, isn't as strong as we'd like it to be. It's certainly a possibility. Um, but just because one species in a group does uh, live in a group doesn't mean that they all do. After all, think about this. Lions and tigers are almost identical if you just look at their skeletons. And you know, tigers are mostly solitary animals, whereas lions, of course, have the most complex social behavior of any of the big cats. So it's quite likely that at least some, and perhaps all, tyrannosaurs were something like Komodo dragons. So Komodo dragons are famous as the largest living lizard, uh, as the top predator of the island of Komodo and some of the other islands in Indonesia in which they occur, where they prey on uh, large mammals like bulls and goats and deer and so forth. And we concentrate on that because that's so impressive. We're not used to seeing lizards big enough to take down a big mammal, but that's just the adults. Most of their life cycle, Komodo dragons don't live that way. Most of the life cycle, Komodo dragons live in the trees. They eat insects and creatures smaller than, much smaller than themselves and are themselves hunted by many other animals. And it's worth noting that, you know, a baby Komodo dragon is a quite small animal compared to an adult Komodo dragon. And the same was true for tyrannosaurs. Uh, in the last year, the first material of 
either hatchling or maybe even pre-hatched embryo tyrannosaurs um, have been described in the technical literature. Uh, it's only bits and pieces. So these silhouettes are, are largely reconstruction. The actual bones involved, you can see, are, are in color here. So there's not much of them. Um, but they do seem to be uh, from Albertosaurus, uh, a tyrannosaur. And here's the skull of an adult, or the, the head of an adult Albertosaurus to scale with these little babies. Um, and the describer, or at least the first author on that paper, Greg Funston. Um, and you might think, you know, these, these babies, are they hatchlings or not? Well, they weren't found in an egg. They were found isolated as bones, but they are of a scale that could fit in the very largest known dinosaur eggs, which are in fact the very largest known carnivorous dinosaur eggs. Now, these are not the eggs of tyrannosaurs. These are eggs of another type of member of the carnivorous dinosaur group. Uh, but we'd expect that tyrannosaur eggs probably were comparably large. And you could fold those babies up and they would be able to fit in these. Now we do have young individuals, very young individuals of many of the tyrannosaurs now. We're getting to know more of them as time goes by. So for instance, here is the upper jawbone of a young Tyrannosaurus rex. And the same bone, although we're actually looking at the inside rather than the outside, of the same bone of a very large individual, in fact, possibly the largest individual of Tyrannosaurus rex. And, you know, they have very different sizes. They have very different presumed shapes and very different ecologies. So how do we actually know how old an individual dinosaur was? And by this, I'm not saying how old, how far back in time they are. That's, that's an entirely different type of science. But I'm saying how old in years were the individuals at their time of death? Well, in the early years of this century, a series of studies came out to show that we could actually age an individual dinosaur at the time of death, because like many modern animals, including their cousins, the crocodilians, uh, dinosaurs had growth rings that basically were laid down once per year. So here is a case of an alligator, and we could see each of these growth rings that were deposited once a year, something like a tree ring would happen. Here's uh, a bone from the Tyrannosaurus gorgosaurus. So it died after or within its fifth year before the end of its sixth year. And here is of a, a large long-necked plant eater that died between 25 and 26. So these lines of arrested growth or lags tell us how old an animal was at the time of death, at least if you can find all of them. In some cases, as the marrow cavity grows, for instance, you have to extrapolate how many were lost. That's going to add, add some pluses or minuses, some uncertainty to your, to your uh, data. Um, we can also find out if the individuals stopped growing. So here is the end of a rib of the famous giant specimen of Tyrannosaurus rex called Sue that's in the collections of the Field Museum in Chicago. And its lines of arrested growth all stack up at the end. So it got to age 19, it was growing consistently throughout its life until age 19 or so. And then it didn't add much body mass every year. It did add a new ring every year, but it didn't add much body mass. So this stacked set of lines of arrested growth, this was called an external fundamental system. And it tells us that that individual reached its full adult size. It wasn't growing anymore. And so we can take different individuals, uh, we can estimate their body size based on their skeleton. We can estimate their age based on the lines of arrested growth. And we can actually develop these profiles, growth profiles of the size at any given age of different species of dinosaurs. And in this case, this is work done by my colleague, Thomas Carr, uh, looking at over 30 individuals of Tyrannosaurus rex to give a good profile of its growth throughout life. I should say, since we're here, just to point out, there's they're relatively, relatively small bodied as youngsters until they reach their early teens. And then they have a phase of rapid growth. And then it slows down after about age 19 or so. 
and they reach essentially full body size. And that boat, that growth profile shouldn't sound that unusual. That's kind of a human growth profile. We're relatively small until we hit our early teens, and then we have our big growth spurt, and that peters out around age 19 or so, uh, at which point, you know, we might add mass, but we typically aren't adding height or anything at that point. Do so, Dr. Holt, ahead. Steve mm -hmm. Cordell is asking what causes the growth lines? Ah, that's a good question. It appears in modern there was a time that people thought that maybe it was just environmental stress and that only animals that lived in a um a in uh, an area of strong seasonality like strong uh dry wet cycles would show that uh but it turns out all kinds of of animals including all kinds of modern mammals produce lines of arrested growth um it seems to be able, it seems to be controlled by the pituitary gland and it's been controlled by what's called photoperiodicity throughout the year so the the brain is controlling how um or getting getting information about how the year is progressing and just during certain times of the year you grow less and other times of the year you grow faster um and it doesn't look like it's the same reason uh, for all species. So like in, in the case of caribou, as you might imagine, the cold season, you don't do much growing in, but we get lines of arrested growth in like tropical monkeys and they don't have a strong seasonality. So uh, that's a long way of saying we don't actually know exactly, but it does seem to be controlled by, uh, uh, by the information that the body's receiving uh, concerning how the year has gone. So that gives us a combination of of the ability to, to see how old an individual was at the time of death. And so we can compare their anatomy um, and aspects of their anatomy based at their age. And that might tell us as to how the lifestyle might change over time. So how did a young tyrant make its living? You know, did they have part-time jobs in a gig ecology instead of a gig economy? And so what I'm gonna do now is take us through a number of different attributes of these animals that are important in terms of their ecology and how they changed throughout their life. And I'll start at the front end, probably the most famous aspect of Tyrannosaurus is this extremely powerful bite, uh, these massive jaws uh, that Tyrannosaurids in general and the Tyrannosaurus in particular um, had adapted. Now, there've been a number of different studies that have looked at uh, the what was the actual bite force? So how much force was generated at an individual tooth tip or somewhere in the jaw um, as a T-Rex would clamp down on some meat? This is just one particular uh, reference. It's actually quite a good one because uh, the scientists involved here looked at a number of different variables, including the parameters of the bones, which is something we know, and parameters based on the muscles, which we have to infer because the muscles aren't preserved, but we could see the various chambers within the jaw um, where they developed, which the muscles fill, uh, filled, and then reconstruct what the bite forces were. And they estimated the overall bite strength and also what pressure was generated at some of the individual teeth. So here's one individual of Tyrannosaurus with the muscles draped in here and all the different muscle groups identified. So that basically that takes this image and digitally removes the rest of the animal. So all you see is the meat. And they found that very large individuals of Tyrannosaurus rex had a bite force of about 34.5 kilonewtons. or that's uh, over 7,700 pounds of force. By comparison, the strongest bite of a land animal today, or in this case, actually a semi-aquatic animal today, is the salty cro crocodile, saltwater crocodile of Australasia, um, whose bite force is only about a half what a big T-Rex has. So 16.4 kilonewtons. And just to give you some comparisons, uh, a human can bite down with a force of about 890 newtons. A spotted hyena, which is a, a very powerful bite for a mammal, has a bite force of 4.5 kilonewtons, or you know about a ninth of what T-Rex could do. Uh, a great white shark, a bite force of 18.2 kilonewtons, so a little more than half of a T-Rex bite. But to be fair, 
Uh, T-Rex, impressive as it was, did not have the strongest bite in Earth history. We do know of at least two other species with stronger bites. One is an extinct super caiman, one of the largest of the crocodilians in Earth history uh, called Perusaurus. And Perusaurus is a really heavily reinforced skull and it's estimated to have a bite force almost twice Tyrannosaurus, which is uh, almost inconceivable. And the um, it's the Meg, though, that seems to have the strongest bite of, on, of, a bite of all. Ototus Megalodon or Caracales Megalodon, um, the giant uh, super white shark, a bite force that's estimated somewhere between 108 and 180 kilonewtons, which is just phenomenal. But those are bite forces for adults. The same researchers estimating smaller individuals of Tyrannosaurus found bite forces and other Tyrannosaurus bite, bite forces only about four kilonewtons. So still impressive, but actually not much stronger, actually not, not even stronger than the bite of a spotted hyena, suggesting that they fed in a rather different fashion. And this makes sense given that the teeth of these individuals are much more blade-like, better for cutting and not so much for bone crushing. So that the ways that tyrannosaurs as teenagers were biting wasn't the massive crushing bone destroying bite that the adults had. Now, of course, almost as famous as their powerful bite is the extremely small and reduced forelimbs of tyrannosaurus, uh, the subject of many cartoons. And I just have, I'm just running a tiny fraction of them that I have in my collection. You know, I could do this for quite some time. Uh, some of them are even animated, the T-Rex slap fight. And yeah, infamously Tyrannosaurus and its cousins has, have extremely small arms. And it's, it's not a joke when people say they couldn't reach their teeth. They couldn't reach their teeth. There's no real position that this adult T-Rex could move its head in so that its arms could easily pick its teeth. As an adult, it's worth noting that as juveniles, although the arms are still small, they are proportionately larger and perhaps more functional at that age. And just to show you, so here is this, this is the most complete so far studied juvenile specimen of Tyrannosaurus rex, an individual at the Burpee Museum that's been nicknamed Jane. Um, and here is the forelimb or rather the upper arm bone, the humerus of Jane. And that's the equivalent bone in the much larger, the 10 times as massive uh, adult specimen called Sue. And yet this arm is not 10 times longer. And here we see on a different specimen, this is actually the original specimen that the name Tyrannosaurus rex was given to. This is on display in Pittsburgh at the Carnegie Museum. And yeah, you can see how ridiculously small those arms are. So it may be that those forelimbs had more of a function in a young Tyrannosaur. Now, they still wouldn't have been the primary weapon they could use to grab prey, but they might have been able to manipulate prey a little better with those arms than an adult would. Similarly, the hind limb changes proportions over time, uh, over age. So here are two specimens of the uh, Tyrannosaur Gorgosaurus shown to scale with each other. So a young individual and a fully grown one. And it's worth noting that tyrannosaurs are actually famous for having long and slender feet. Um, so here are the feet of some typical meat-eating dinosaurs. Here's the famous Allosaurus, uh, the most common Jurassic predatory dinosaur in North America and Europe. And here is the foot of a um, Majungasaurus, which is a late Cretaceous form from Madagascar. And they're relatively broad, and in particular that middle bone so the middle of the three weight-bearing bones is about the same thickness from the bottom to the top. And that's different from what we see in a Tyrannosaur. They have these narrow, compressed feet. So here's a Gorgosaurus specimen. Uh, it's got a, a wedge shape at the base, and then it's just basically a splint of bone at the top. It's much longer and more slender. And I'll, yes, this is a young individual, but here's a, an adult individual of Tarbosaurus, the giant Mongolian one. And you could see it's a very similarly long and slender and compressed foot. It's also worth noting that the same sort of feet are found in the so-called ostrich dinosaurs or ornithomimids. So here is an ornithomimid and here is the foot of one, same basic adaptation. 
when we look at a young individual of Tyrannosaurus or Gorgosaurus or other Tyrannosaurid, they actually have very similar feet to ostrich dinosaurs of about the same size. And in fact, this specimen of a young Tyrannosaurus was mislabeled as coming from Struthiomimus, so a type of ostrich dinosaur. When first discovered, they didn't appreciate that it was actually a Tyrannosaurid. And here we can see sort of comparable individuals of a young Tyrannosaurus rex and an ostrich dinosaur again. So we can actually show mathematically that young Tyrannosaurs had actually had ostrich dinosaur like leg proportions. And so for this, I just need to do a little basic anatomy of the hind limb. So the femur, that's the thigh bone. The tibia is the shin bone. And the metatarsus are the long bones of the feet. So much like cats and dogs and chickens, um, dinosaurs like T-Rex were walking on their tiptoe on their toes all the time, basically on the balls of their feet, with their ankles in the air. So these are the bones that go between the toes to the ankle, the metatarsus. So we're going to compare the length of the metatarsus to the length of the thigh, the femur. And we see for a bunch of members of the carnivorous dinosaur group that tyrannosaurs who are here in the sort of, I don't know what you would call that, umber um, squares have much longer metatarsi, much longer feet than do other giant predatory dinosaurs when compared to the length of the femur. And when we get to the area of overlap, we find that the ostrich dinosaurs and the young tyrannosaurs have essentially the same proportions. Now, the ostrich dinosaurs were long thought of as being the fastest of the Mesozoic dinosaurs, a fa famous scene in uh, the first Jurassic Park movie with a flock of Gallimimus, which is a type of ostrich dinosaur running by. And yet a young Tyrannosaurus or a young Gorgosaurus has exactly the same limb proportions. Now, unfortunately, we are not yet at the stage where we can actually take in the limb measurements and within a narrow range of possibilities, calculate the speed, the maximum speed animals can move. And that's actually true of modern animals as well as ones in the past. People are working on this, but we're not quite there. So we can look for tracks as ways of estimating speed. Now, the problem is you're unlikely to have animals leaving footprints at their maximum speed because we get footprints in as fossils because the animals were walking in or running in mud. Um, if it was just dry ground, there's no sediment to preserve the impression. We need something sloppy that preserves the impression. And as most of us know, we don't typically run our best in mud. So we actually do have a couple cases of uh, tracks made by what are probably uh, teenage tyrannosaurs. Uh, here's one from Northwestern British Columbia, where the animal was moving somewhere between 6.4 and 8.5 kilometers an hour. So not super fast, but not particularly slow. And another one, and this is almost assuredly a young Tyrannosaurus rex, because it's from the same rocks that Tyrannosaurus rex comes from. And it's going at 8.1 to 12.5 kilometers an hour. So this is an individual, incidentally, about the same size of that specimen that I called Sue or that I, I mentioned was named Sue. However, it's worth noting that having long and slender legs, we call cursorial or running adaptations, might be more than just maximum attained speed. There's more than one aspect to being a runner. You know, maximum attained speed is important, but so is acceleration. Or so is the uh, amount of range you cover in a given day, your home range. And animals can have elongated legs, stretched out legs, for other reasons. Sometimes it has to do with the habitat they live in. So the maned wolf is not a super fast cheetah speed wolf. It just happens to live in grasslands. And so it's very long and long legged. Or even feeding styles. So uh, a secretary bird is not a fast runner. And it actually uses very long legs to stomp on, um, on snakes and so forth. So there's more than one reason to have very long legs. So one thing that people have considered is what this means for the agility. Now, how can we possibly assess agility in a fossil? Right now, we could assess the, the agility of the individuals now. We lay them on a table, and they don't do anything. So they're totally not agile. But we want to know what they were like in life.
And so uh, a couple years ago, uh, various colleagues of mine, um, including myself in here, um, had a paper where we tried to estimate the turning ability in various types of carnivorous dinosaurs. So how could we possibly do that? Well, in order to assess agility, what we were, we were looking for among various uh, carnivorous dinosaurs of various sizes, and over here marked with the asterisk, that's the Tyrannosaurid, that's the specimen Sioux of T-Rex, is to look at angular acceleration. So the torque, so the twisting forces generated on the body versus its resistance to being twisted. It's what we call rotational inertia. So how do we go about estimating that? Well, in order to estimate the rotational inertia, we took scale models or scale drawings in this case of a number of different carnivorous dinosaurs and basically digitally or mathematically sliced them up like a sausage into a series of sections. Don't worry, there's no quiz. You're not going to be tested on this math. And I didn't do the math part of this anyway. So, um, For each slice, uh, we got its, got its volume. We then estimated how much mass would be represented by each of these volumes based on the density expected in the various parts of the body. So for instance, in the trunk of the body, you've got lungs, you've got air sacs, um, you've got guts, and so that's actually less dense there. Uh, the skull, pretty dense, uh, but there's also some open air spaces and different parts of the body we had different mass, uh, different densities for. So we calculated that, and then we have this distribution of mass over the length of the body. Now, in terms of estimating the torque, what we did is we measured the likely sizes of the muscles that are involved in the twisting. So these include muscles attached to the, the pelvis, the upper part of the pelvis, it's called the ilium, and the muscles that run from the femur, from the thigh bone, onto the tail. And we actually used a couple different models of how large those muscles would be to give us an estimate as a range of estimations. And we even tried two different scenarios. One is turning about on a single foot. And the other one is planting both feet and then turning. And throughout, we then calculated our estimates of agility. And here's a rough estimate of, of what we're doing in terms of figuring out agility uh, for different forms. And we found consistently that tyrannosaurs, who are shown here in blue, were more agile than non-tyrannosaurs in red for any given body size. So along the bottom, that's body size. Uh, it's a log scale here. Um, and so these folks down here, these individuals, these are young indiv uh, teenage individuals of various tyrannosaurs. So there's Jane, the specimen of uh, T. rex I was showing before. Here is the specimen of the um, uh, Gorgosaurus I was showing before, a young individual, almost the same size. And we could compare their agility to comparable sized other forms. But we can also compare how agile the young ones are to the adults. And we see that young tyrannosaurs, not surprisingly, vastly more agile than the big ones. And agility is useful in a predator in a number of ways. Uh, it, it's helpful for hunting smaller and a smaller prey, which is itself more agile and perhaps better defended. It's also thinking about it the other direction. Uh, a carnivorous dinosaur, a theropod that's more stable, that's less agile, you know, maybe it's going up something where it's got to assert more force against the creatures that it's feeding on and being light and nimble relatively speaking, is less important. Uh, but we also looked at the locomotion of dinosaurs in a different way. And one of them had to do with sort of the uh, energetics and economies of having long legs. So in a paper uh, that I was involved with that came out last year, we looked at how the energetics of locomotion worked, and especially how it changed over body size. So we compared long-legged and more normal-legged carnivorous dinosaurs at a variety of body sizes and determined how it might affect their locomotion. 
And we did this over a wide range of sizes from little things, you know, road rudder sized animals uh, like Compson aphids um, up to rhino and elephant sized forms like T. rex. And we found that for carnivorous dinosaurs, for theropods that were one ton or more, having longer legs didn't seem to increase your speed that much. It did a bit, but not that much. But what it really did is it decreased the cost of transport. You became much more efficient at moving longer distances if you had longer legs. In contrast, for little guys, longer legs did wind up giving you more speed. And so for little forms, for forms less than a ton, that's really helpful, not only for hunting, but also for escaping because you yourself are prey. For the big guys, it's more the efficiency. Or as we like to point it out, for little guys, longer legs is good for sprinting. For big ones, longer legs is good for marathoning. Well, consider that a young tyrannosaur would be an animal less than one ton. So its long legs are really helping it with speed. For the big guys, maybe not so much, but it was helpful in terms of their efficiency. So Jane here, um, that's the wrong specimen number. That's the specimen number for Sue. Uh, Jane here uh, probably was a real speed demon, whereas something like Sue, an adult T-Rex, probably wasn't. It was still probably faster than other large carnivorous dinosaurs, and certainly faster than big duckbills and horn dinosaurs, its prey items, uh, but nowhere near the speed demon that the younger tyrannosaurs were. And that makes sense. After all, if you are a giant like the specimen Sioux, your likely prey animals themselves are not particularly fast. And with your powerful bone crushing bite, you can take them down without having to grapple with them that much in terms of your arms and so forth. In contrast, if you are a young Tyrannosaurus, you're not going after a big duckbill, a big horn dinosaur. If you do that, you're toast. Uh, they will take you down. Um, but you're going after the smaller animals of your community, creatures that the adult T-Rex probably would have great difficulty capturing. And so you may not have the powerful bone crushing bite that the other ones that the adults do, but you don't need it to take out these much smaller prey. And being a fast, agile animal will help you catch any of these sorts of smaller dinosaurs. Now, the last item I'm going to talk about is research uh, that I've been working on for a while in a paper that's coming out this year. Um, I was actually hoped it was out already, but uh, production delays have, well, delayed it. It should be out sometime later this month or June. Um, and that's looking at differences between communities with tyrannosaurs as the apex predators versus communities in which other types of carnivorous dinosaurs were present. This paper is actually coming out in a volume that is a tribute to the late paleontologist Dale Russell, one of Canada's greatest dinosaur paleontologists of the 20th and early 21st century. And it was actually a really great guy and helped me out a lot in my early career. And I was very happy to be able to help out on this uh, volume. But it's worth noting that similar conclusions to mine, not exactly the same, but many of the uh, conclusions are very similar, were independently found uh, by a team of paleontologists that was published earlier this year. Um, and, you know, that's, that's often very comforting to see that independent teams uh, looking at the same data using different approaches come to very similar conclusions. Uh, that's probably pretty good evidence that you're on the right track. So if we look at a community of theropods, of the group that we broadly call carnivorous dinosaurs that live together. So these, for instance, are the last giant dinosaurs of Western North America, including Tyrannosaurus rex. We see a wide variety of forms, but it's worth noting that the forms over here, although they're members of the carnivorous dinosaur group, were not carnivores. Uh, these are herbivores or omnivores or insectivores. And so instead, we have this distribution of a very large form and then some much smaller forms in the community. And if what you look at are mostly tyrannosaur dominated communities, you might think that's the typical way for dinosaurs, but it isn't. So tyrannosaurs were only around in the later part of the late Cretaceous of Eastern Asia, Eastern Central Asia and Western North America. 
at the same time that abele saurids were common in many other parts of the world and so forth. But for most of dinosaurian history, it was other groups, in particular the allosauroids and the megalosauroids, that include the spinosaurids, that were the apex predators. And before them, earliest earlier types of dinosaurs and indeed non-dinosaurs before that. So if you look at a Jurassic community of dinosaurs, we find that there's a much more even distribution of carnivores that lived side by side. I mean, many of these are found, in fact, in the same quarry. So they lived and died at the same place. And in these communities, very few of them were non-carnivorous members of the carnivorous dinosaur group. So it was a much more even distribution of ecologies. So if we look at them, we can consider the carnivores in this environment to be a guild. In terms of ecology, a guild is a group that exploits the same class of environmental resources in a similar way. So we might think about the predatory mammals of the Serengeti, and we would have the big cats, we would have uh, the painted wolf, and we would have the spotted hyena, for instance. And so what I've done in this paper is I looked at a variety of communities of dinosaurs and statistically compared them in particular to see Tyrannosaurid versus non-Tyrannosaurid dominated communities. These are some stats. Again, there's not going to be a quiz, so don't worry. And in fact, instead of lumping entire geological formations into one unit, I tried to be as close as possible to the actual community of dinosaurs that would have lived at the same time, because a, a, a geologic formation can often take millions of years to deposit, but individual species don't live for that entire duration. So I, where possible, split up these communities of dinosaurs into subdivided faunal zones. Um, generally following research done by various colleagues uh, who have been able to look at what we call the stratigraphy, the succession of forms and units through time. And in fact, if we have two successive species with very similar morphologies, but they don't overlap, I would treat them as one so that I'm not overinflating the number of species that lived at any one moment in time. And so I asked a number of questions. And the first one, the most important one, I think, to start out with was, are the guilds in which tyrannosaurs, or their closest relatives, in which they're the apex uh, predators, are those actually different from those in which other types of dinosaurs were the largest? And so here's the distribution in size of various species in different communities of dinosaurs. And this is a law, not quite a log scale at the bottom, but each size class uh, looks at, you know, so the ones greater than five tons, one to five tons, etc. So this is a tyrannosaur dominated community and you'll see a green tyrannosaur for those. And these are non tyrannosaur dominated communities and you'll see a purple allosaurus for those. And so when we look at a tyrannosaur dominated community, it's very common to find missing size classes in terms of the adult size of the different species. So three missing size classes between the smallest of the dinosaur eating uh, theropods and the largest ones. In contrast, you'll find very few missing size classes in the non-tyrannosaur dominated communities. And indeed, when we run the statistics on this, we find that both the mean and the median, so two different forms of averages of the uh, community size or rather of the number of missing uh, missing size classes, um, that the tyrannosaurs were confirmed to be different, to have more missing size classes than non-tyrant ones. And this isn't just a matter of undersampling. You might think, well, maybe in the tyrannosaur communities, you just haven't looked long enough to find the missing sizes. But many of these tyrant-dominated faunas are, the, are among the best sampled dinosaur formations of all of the history of paleontology, where there are multiple teams digging every summer back for more than 100 years, and yet we're not finding these medium-sized species. And in contrast, some of the ones that have the most even distribution of sizes have only had a couple of field seasons, and yet people have been able to pick out these different size classes among these forms, and they're distinctly different species. So is it perhaps that these 
non-Tyrannosaur dominated communities simply had a bigger menu to choose from, that there were more types of prey diversity? Well, I plotted the number, total number of species and the total number of carnivores and found that in fact, statistically, they're identical, Tyrannosaurid and non-Tyrannosaurid dominated. There's no statistical distinction in the number of potential prey items. So that's not what's driving this. Now, one possibility that was suggested to me as, when, when I was presenting this research before is maybe it's because there are many sauropods, that is the long-necked plant eaters that allows the closer packing and some of these other guilds of theropods. So these are the different sauropod species through the six different uh, biozones in the history of the Morrison formation. After all, sauropods, they're tasty food that run from happy meal sized babies up to family bucket sized adult, adults. And it's true that in most, not all, but in most of the tyrannosaur dominated communities, sauropods are absent. And in fact, we found, I found the same pattern that I did when I looked at tyrannosaurid versus non-tyrannosaurid dominated communities in non-sauropod communities, uh, there were more missing, sauro, uh, more missing predator sizes than there were in ones in which there were sauropods. And that leaves us with an unsolved mystery, which happened first. Now we know that sauropods become extinct or at least very rare in the middle of late Cretaceous history in Asia America. Was it that they went extinct or became rare there first and theropods filled in the gaps? Or did the tyrannosaurids, uh, the tyrannosaurids uh, filled in the ecological gaps or did tyrannosaurids wipe out the re sauropods regionally and their previous predators, the allosauroids, and then were left in a community with these missing size gaps? We don't know yet. We honestly don't know. We know at the very beginning of the late Cretaceous that the ancestors of the Tyrannosaurids had evolved many of the adaptations that the giants had, but did so at a much smaller body size. And so my hypothesis is that the juvenile and subadult Tyrannosaurids had, as I said, assimilated the vacant middle-sized predator niches that although they were the same species, as the adults, that the younger individuals were ecologically like distinct species than the adults. And they were filling in these vacant spots that were once occupied by other groups of theropods. Now, the idea of niche assimilation was first, um, a the name was coined by my uh, friend and colleague, Mike Brett Sermon, formerly of the Smithsonian. Now, in his context, he was looking at it by comparing mammalian communities to dinosaur ones and pointing out out that in a mammal community, you'll have many different species of herbivore running in this case in the in the plains of the Serengeti from like a dick dick all the way up to an African elephant. In a dinosaur community, those would all be the same species or could potentially be. So the duckbill Edmontosaurus runs from a dick dick, dick, dick sized hatching hatchling to a larger than African elephant sized adult. Uh, but what I, what I was using this phrase for is the idea that tyrannosaurids may have assimilated the ecology that was once occupied by many distinct sorts of carnivorous dinosaurs. And this has an implication. It, you might expect there to be rapid and extreme, extreme changes in the anatomy of an individual tyrannosaur, reflecting its shift in its ecological niche. And indeed, a number of studies, including the ones on speed versus endurance and, and agility and bite forces that I've already mentioned, all those shift over rapidly in the life history of individual tyrannosaurids. And we see a similar change in the life history of Komodo dragons. Uh, instead of sort of a gradual shift from one form to another, they change very rapidly in terms of the size of the prey they go after, the home range they have, and so forth. And we now have information uh, from at least one other Tyrannosaur-sized predator to show that its growth curve shows no rapid shift in its body form. Now, we don't have many individuals to really map out what those earlier stages looked like, uh, but we're able to map out the size at various ages in it 
And uh, it turns out to have a much more slow and gradual change and not a rapid transformation. So additionally, I speculate that when we know the latest Cretaceous, the end of the age of dinosaurs, from various parts of the southern continents better, we'll see a similar pattern. And the reason to suspect that is when we get to that end of the age of dinosaurs in South America and Africa and India and so forth, it looks like each of those just has one giant predator and then a few smaller predators. So the similar situation to what we see in Asia America. But the thing is we don't have the sample sizes yet for younger individuals of these giant predators to really map out those changes. And so a general plea that I have, I know tyrannosaurs are awesome and there's a tremendous amount of great research that's been done on them, but other carnivorous dinosaurs, they need love too. They need some attention. And so with that, I bring this look at the changing lifestyles of tyrannosaurs throughout their uh, growth uh, to a close. And we can learn a lot from tyrannosaurs, including the fact that although the pandemic is hopefully on its last legs, we still need to be careful and follow all the appropriate directives uh, so that our community is healthy, so we can come together as people, as communities again. Uh, and I want to especially thank some of my colleagues who did the slides with regard to agility and turning as part of our, uh, our research in the past. And um, I want to thank the friends of the Arlington Planetarium for inviting me out here to speak, out here to speak as I speak from my home. Um, I also want to bring up the fact that in the forthcoming weekend, uh, Balticon, the Baltimore Science Fiction Society's Science Fiction Convention, uh, is coming up. It's free. It's virtual. Um, I'm giving several talks there, including one as an update of what's gone on in dinosaur research over the past year, uh, and another one about um, the fossil discoveries of Charles Darwin uh, when he was doing his research in South America. And also that I can be contacted by a number of different methods, uh, email, website, Twitter, and I have some previously recorded lectures, uh, public lectures available on YouTube in case you want to check those out. And so with that, I will take some questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Holtz. We did have some questions during, let's see if Great. I can go back through here. Um, we had someone who is uh, asking about, um, social behavior um, sure. and comparing the social behavior of grizzly bears to some tyrannosaurs. And they actually asked about uh, if no signs of cannibalism show between adult and teen tyrannosaurs, would grizzly bears be a comparative reference to Albertosaurus, which has been found together at multiple ages? Right. Uh, well, a couple issues there. One, uh, there are, there is potential evidence of cannibalism in uh, a number of tyrannosaurids, um, but that doesn't dissuade the possibility of social behavior as well. Also, you know, we might think cannibalism is just about as unsocial a behavior as we could possibly have. Um, but we can't say necessarily that those individuals were members of the same a group unit if they were social individuals, you know, a, a tyrannosaurus that comes across the body of another tyrannosaurus is probably going to eat it just as much as anything else. Uh, in the case of Albertosaurus, yeah, we have a couple cases where we have multiple individuals that of different growth sizes that were found dead together. We now can add to that Teratophonius, a, um, a, a close relative of the Tyrannosauridae, uh, that, in which we see that. Um, the question is, however, are these actual evidence that they lived in long-term group associations or families, um, or is this a mass accumulation um, through some other means? Um, and although I would you know, personally think it would be great if it is a family association, those that's actually a very difficult hypothesis to test. Um, and so far, although we have had cases of multiple tracks of individuals of tyrannosaurids found at the same spot, those are all individuals of about the same size. And it, it looks like a common pattern in dinosaurs is that individuals of the same age cohort traveled together, you know, like packs of teens going around a mall. Um, so um, um, it, it's uncertain if the Albertosaurus 
if Albertosaurus sarcophagus actually was a, uh, a social dinosaur or not, it might have been. Um, as for grizzly bears, as a comparison, um, the issues with a lot of big carnivorous mammals is that they're they're definitely provisioned by mom, as typically mom, uh, until quite late in development. Um, you know, whether you're a leopard or a cheetah or a bear or something, uh, it's rare. The, the, the young are quite late stage in terms of, of anatomy uh, before they're off on their own. Um, and it doesn't look like that's a common phenomenon in dinosaurs. It may have been in at least some, but it's hard to demonstrate. And so, and additionally, even if they're living together as groups, we don't know necessarily that they were feeding necessarily together in groups. Uh, there's a lot of things that, you know, you can answer by going out in the field and watching a modern animal that unfortunately we can't do with these things that are dead. So we have a whole bunch of questions coming in now. Sure, great. Um, and we've had uh, one asking, when I was a kid many years ago, nobody talked about dinosaurs having feathers. But more recently, I've heard that all or almost all dinosaurs were covered in feathers. What's the straight dope? All right. So the issues with feathers. Um, the In 1996, a site in northern, northeastern, China, what used to be Manchuria, uh, was discovered where through the luck of geology, we had lake deposits that had extraordinarily fine, the very small uh, mud that was actually derived from volcanic ash. And it was a deep enough lake that the bottom water was anoxic. So it was lacking in oxygen and therefore there weren't worms and clams burrowing through it. And because you have this combination of a, a medium that can record very fine detail, in an environment that wasn't disturbed, all kinds of details were preserved. The fur on mammals, complete flowers, complete insects, the skin impressions of amphibians, and the body covering of dinosaurs. And this included the first fuzz discovered on a non-bird dinosaur and the first feathers found on non-bird dinosaurs. Um, some of the dinosaurs in questions were in fact tyrannosaurs, uh, early tyrannosaurs like uh, D. Long and later U. Tyrannus. Now a couple other spots in the world have similar modes of preservation as we say and have added to our database and a couple more time slices um, in terms of uh, the distribution of fuzz on non-bird dinosaurs. And we now definitely have some primitive members of the bird-hipped dinosaurs, uh, which are the group that includes duckbills and horned dinosaurs and dome heads and stegosaurs with fuzz. We have primitive meat-eating dinosaurs, including tyrannosauroids with fuzz. And then we have honest to goodness, true feathers in the dinosaurs closest to birds. So those would be things like uh, the raptor dinosaurs, like Velociraptor and Deinonychus, not those two particular um, genera, but close relatives of those, as well as uh, the oviraptorosaurs, which were sort of beaky relatives of that, omnivorous forms. Um, and so the possibility exists that fuzz is ancestral to the first dinosaurs. Uh, the possibility also exists that fuzz evolves independently in the bird-hipped lineage and the carnivorous dinosaurs. Um, it's worth noting that the next time down the family tree that we pick up what's on the skin of any of the relatives of dinosaurs are the pterosaurs, where most, but for fairness sake, I have to say not all, most researchers agree that there's fuzz. So it's actually quite possible that the common ancestor of pterosaurs and dinosaurs was a fuzzy animal. And I'm not a betting person. Science shouldn't be done by bets. However, if I were a betting person, I would say the better, the chances are, in my opinion, quite high that we will discover that the common ancestor of pterosaurs and dinosaurs was fuzzy. And the reason for that is the, both those lineages start from a very tiny group of very small animals with long legs fast-moving, small-bodied animals, the huge surface area to volume ratio, 
and bone textures that showed that they grew at very rapid rates, so suggesting they had a very high me metabolic rate. So if you have an animal with a very high metabolic rate, it's dumping out a lot of heat, and you're a small body size, you're going to be wasting a lot of energy unless you're insulated. Um, and so my I strongly suspect, but we'll see how the science leads us, that the common ancestor of pterosaurs and dinosaurs were fuzzy. Now, that's not to say that individual branches of dinosaurs could lose fuzz to some degree or other. We definitely know many dinosaurs were scaly. We even know that tyrannosaurids were scaly, um, at least in part. Um, in fact, may have been mostly scaled. Um, but that doesn't mean they weren't from fuzzy ancestors. Excellent. Um, and we have someone asking about your book, The Dinosaurs Most Complete Up-to-Date Encyclopedia. And uh, they said they heard that you're writing a second edition. And do you have an idea when it will be published and if it will include the most recent studies and work done, including yours? Um, I, I have not gotten to the second edition of the big, big green book yet. I do plan on getting to that. I have my next project with Random House. Hang on. <laughs> Here's here's a copy of the marked up manuscript. Oops, here it is. <laughs> you see, got editorial comments on it and everything. Um, I got to get this cleaned up for them and sent back. Uh, this is a kids' book on Tyrannosaurus. Um, also in the works is the third edition of the Complete Dinosaur for Indiana University Press. We have some, but not all, chapters of this uh, finished up. Um, We've got a number of different contributing authors. We have other chapters we're still awaiting uh, versions of. Um, and so that's the other big project I have to get out and through uh, the publication process before I start working on uh, the Big Green Book. But the Big Green Book, which may not be green in the next edition, we'll see. I like green, though, so hopefully it will be. Um, that one, we will. Uh, uh, I will definitely be updating the research as much as I can to include the latest research, including my own. Uh, great. Uh, I also have uh, someone asking, do we have an idea why niche, niche assimilation didn't happen with the allosaurs? Ah, I, I think the issue there is that there were already plenty of other carnivorous dinosaur groups um, that it looks difficult if there is already, um, what's the phrase I'm looking for here? Incumbency. Niche incumbency looks like it's a pretty important factor in ecology. That if you already have a species or a group occupying a particular niche, it is difficult for another species to move into that niche because it will not already have all the adaptations for that way of life and the creature that already is in that uh, in that way of life, it does. So um, it's difficult uh, for you to outcompete them. So which is why my suspicion is that we're going to find when we start knowing more about that mid late Cretaceous transition that we'll see it's an extrinsic factor that there's something extrinsic in the environment that causes a an ecological, you know, turnover, you know, mini mass extinction or something like that, a major environmental change that opened up those parts of the ecosystem that allowed the then small tyrannosaurs to then grow in to occupy the uh, space of being the apex predators, which is why I'm also uh, suspect that we'll find out something similar happens in Gondwana, in the southern continents at the same time, or around the same time. Because the abelisaurids, who are the apex predators for much of Gondwana during the latest Cretaceous, um, they were around for quite some time, but they were mid-sized, they were middling carnivores for most of their history. And then they had their chance when the big allosauroids disappeared. So uh, running out of time here, but I've got two more that I just want to throw out at, uh, to you here real quickly. One, were you able to get DNA from the tyrants? And two, is the debate over cold-blooded versus warm-blooded <laughs> over? <laughs> okay. Uh, one very quick answer, one that I'll just have to uh, skim the stuff because I could go on all day. Um, DNA from tyrants? No. Uh, sadly, the there was a recent 
study that actually pushed back um, the age of the oldest DNA. And I think it was coming up on like about a million years. Um, and previously it had just been a few hundreds of thousands. So we're still well outside that range in terms of, of getting to 66 million years to get the last of the giant dinosaurs, sadly. Um, in, in terms of cold-blooded, warm-blooded, um, although no one has yet a 100% slam, slam dunk way of, uh, of demonstrating that in a fossil organism, I think the weight of a number of lines of recent research, including the rate at which uh, new bone tissue is laid down, uh, the blood flow, per, blood for perfusion rates, that is blood flow rates through bones, which you can look at by the size of the vessels going through it, um, and by the temperature at which the eggshells were crystallized inside the body, which is a, a rather different approach, but you know, they're being formed inside the body and they're, they're recording the temperature at which they're forming for a number of different forms of dinosaurs um, are all consistent with them being warm blooded. And um, what I sort of relating at before, I think we're gonna find that warm bloodedness was actually an ancestral trait, trait for dinosaurs, that it was present in the common ancestor of pterosaurs and dinosaurs, which takes us actually all the way back to seven, the seventies and then Bob Bakker proposing it back then. Um, I will say one of the cooler things, sorry, cooler things about warm bloodedness, I'm sorry. Um, one of the more interesting things that's come out of warm blooded research that isn't getting a lot of attention is there's been a lot of work in the last decade that really looks strongly as if ichthyosaurs, plesiosaurs, and mosasaurs were all warm blooded. Uh, the big three in terms of the marine reptiles of the Mesozoic. And that actually is really interesting in that in the modern world, the warm-blooded fish, because there are warm-blooded fish and you don't hear about them that often, are things like tuna, some of the sharks, and the billfish. And in all these cases, both the marine Mesozoic forms and the, the living fish, they're all open seas, what we call pelagic pursuit predators. Uh, and it looks like that kind of ecology um, is very favorable in the oceans to evolving into warm bloodedness. Wow. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Holtz. Um, I, uh, I, we really are appreciative of you uh, coming and speaking to us virtually today. We hope that we can get you to come back to the planetarium once we get the planetarium open and, uh, and give a talk or two there as well. In the meantime, uh, I hope that all of you will uh, go to Virtual Balticon next week and that you get a chance to uh, hear Dr. Holtz talk some more about dinosaurs. Um, again, I'm Kathy Overton. I'm with the Friends of the Planetarium. We hope that you have uh, enjoyed uh, today's talk. We hope that you'll tune in next time. It seems like we were able to get YouTube to work this time. Uh, so it should be easier for people to find us in the future. Uh, keep tuned. In uh, June, we should be having a talk about uh, privatized space industry. Uh, so uh, keep, uh, keep your eyes open for that. Uh, until next time, thanks so much for watching, and we hope to see you soon.